seems like we're all here. Uh, welcome to the Department of Theatre, Film and Television and welcome to the first AES event on gender equality, supporting the United Nations campaign uh, called He for She to support gender equality. I spent the last few days wondering what I was going to tell you when I stood here and introduced the event. And I spent loads of long walks from here home thinking what I should say and what the right thing to say is, and wondering how much of a responsibility is to introduce an event that is so close to my heart and also so close to the hearts of many of the people here today. Last night, it dawned on me that what I wanted to tell you is that I wish I wasn't here and I wish you weren't here today, or I'd rather wish we were here to talk about something else. We have today five wonderful professionals from the audio industry, and instead of talking about their wonderful achievements, we're going to be talking about a basic human right, the right to be considered because of your own merits and not because of gender. So it does sadden me that we cannot be here talking about something else. It's 2018 after all. It does, though, feel fill me with joy to see you all here because we need to have these conversations and we need to be here talking about gender equality. That is the first step we need to take. And until that changes, and I think we have a long road ahead of us, we will continue having this event and we're going to continue pushing for equality. In the last few months, I've been profoundly moved by the number of campaigns that have started in rise to challenges to inequality in the creative industries. The Me Too campaign has shown us how serious the problem of sexual harassment is, as millions of women have taken online platforms to say Me Too. And today I'm sad to say Me Too, and I'm sad to say that I know if I asked many women here, they would say Me Too too. Last week, BAFTA's red carpet filled with men and women wearing black in support of the Time's Up campaign, a campaign that supports uh, underrepresented groups so that they can achieve their full potential. Also last week, BAFTA, BFI and Equity joined forces to write guidelines against sexual harassment and bullying. So I have a feeling in my heart that things are changing and that we might be in the verge of a gender re revolution, which I'm very happy that we're all part of. But why AES and why He for She? The He for She campaign launched on the 20th of September 2014 with one of the most inspiring speeches in gender equality I've ever had the pleasure to hear. And that was a speech by Goodwill Ambassador Emma Watson, who we've You've never heard her speak about equality, you should. She's a wonderful spokesperson. He for she invites everyone to take a stance on gender equality. It invites everyone to recognize that gender issues are not a woman's problem, that they are everyone's problems, and puts men at the center of taking responsibility for gender equality. The AES only has 5% of female membership. So, to me, having a campaign, supporting a campaign that invites men to support equality and speak up in support of their female colleagues is incredibly important. Charlie Slee, uh, the past chair of the AES UK and myself, started working in supporting the He For She campaign in April last year. And we started by inviting people, uh, mainly AES members, but also people from the audio community, to sign an online pledge to the campaign which after all takes two minutes and is free. You go online, you write your name, your email address, and you get a thank you email for committing to gender equality. You wouldn't imagine how hard it is to get people to do something that's free, but requires entering your name and email address. And I do appreciate the very recent and wonderful efforts that our York AES student section is doing to support the campaign. So thank you very much for all the work you do to support us. But I have a confession to make. When we decided to launch the campaign last year, I hid from my colleagues a fear, and was the fear that I knew we were going to get a backlash. I knew we were going to get criticism online. 
I didn't say anything because I knew they would get, they would get scared and suddenly they wouldn't want to campaign for gender equality because of the fear of getting bad publicity. But we launched the campaign and there weren't any issues, so I put that fear at bay until the Sunday, 2nd of July, an email arrived at my inbox. And many of you will be familiar with this text because it went viral as I posted it in its anonymized form. But I will read it to you because I'm assured that many of you don't know of the story. And this is the email that came to my inbox as a response of an AES UK newsletter that I sent together with my male colleagues um, announcing our alignment to the he for she campaign, among other audio related matters. This person wrote the following. The latest AES UK newsletter says we're now formally aligned to a campaign to make a moral commitment to gender equality. It's not clear to me what the campaign stands for. If they're wanting a 50-50 gender balance everywhere, then well, just no. Recently, I went to a talk on marketing, which had hard evidence that typical male and female brains are different and respond differently. So in a job that needs the kind of skills you typically find in male brains, you're likely to find that the majority of workers are male. That's evolution. Deal with it. And there's no particular reason why it's a bad thing for the majority of engineers to be male. Unlike, for instance, primary school teaching, teachers being 90% female, which deprives the boys of role models. The other problem I have with that kind of campaign is that it's so one-sided. You don't get men campaigning to be allowed to join the Women's Institute, for instance, although their meetings often include talks on topics that are of general interest. Female students going up to Cambridge have the option of a single-sex college. Males don't. However, if it's simply to make sure that, for instance, people aren't discriminated against, then it's a worthy aim. But I still feel uneasy about harnessing AES, a group that should be concentrating on engineering, to be a political campaign. Of course, it would be a good idea if there was a problem within our industry, but I really haven't seen evid any evidence that there is. It would be better to campaign against sound pressure levels that injure people's hearing. <laughs> I wish I was making this up, but this is the extent of the email I received from the 2nd of July. Of course, this person, as I'm sure you noticed, failed to see that he's a big part of the problem. And him not seeing evidence of the problem is because he is a representative of our very problem. What happened after that was unsurprising. The email went viral. Uh, we had a huge amount, overwhelming support uh, from many people of the audio community telling us how they were grateful we had shared the story because they got the stories to tell. They got emails like that, comments on a daily basis. Just to give you an example, last week uh, a colleague from the audio community uh, said, I quote, you give me grief about gender equality. That's because I commented on his 100% male speaker lineup. So suddenly, it wasn't his fault, it was my fault, because I had pointed it out. So a lot of people in the audio community were grateful for raising this. But there were those that felt that the AES UK committee had sunk to the level of this person by sharing the information, even if it was verbatim. I was suddenly being accused of being discriminating against men. Uh, my Twitter account got comments of uh, uh, using positive discrimination for hiring, which I have never done in my life. So that wasn't a very nice thing to get as part of the campaign. But this person made us incredibly popular. <laughs> Posting this email made a, a campaign even stronger. So I often wonder if I should run into him in the street, if I should actually thank him for making my campaign even better. What many people don't know is what was written back to this person. And it's because Charlie and I agreed on this between us and kept it amongst ourselves. But today I thought that our launch event uh, in preparation for International Women's Day is the day in which I would like to share our response to it. And the reason why I'm going to share this response to you because, is because it expresses 
the commitment ASUK has to gender equality and the fact that we're always going to keep fighting, doesn't matter what the backlash is. So this is what we wrote. And it was sent under my name. I'd say it's good to hear from you, but I think it's obvious that under the circumstances, I can't say such a thing, which saddens me, as you very well know how much work I do for the AAS. And it surprises me that an educated professional as yourself could have such narrow-minded views. Even then, I will go ahead and explain to you in the next few paragraphs a bit more about the campaign, and I hope you reconsider your views. It is a shame you didn't visit the He for She website because you would then have found out that the UN campaign works on gender equality for everyone. For example, challenging male stereotypes that have led to fewer men taking on parenting duties or boys not playing with dolls. I recommend you visit the website and find out more. I agree, boys, boys need male teachers as role models. Girls need female engineers as role models. It works both ways. You're quoting a marketing talk as scientific findings. I'd very much like to see their research and invite you to look into the work of University of York's Paul Walton, whose research says exactly the opposite. The arguments you're giving or that were given to you in that marketing talk very much resemble arguments used by people trying to defend racism. So I would consider where you get your data from. We will continue working on disseminating gender equality within audio through the AES. Your email shows me why we need to do this, and you have given me even more reasons to continue working. We will continue doing our excellent work on audio engineering plus gender equality work. Using your own words, I'm going to continue working on gender equality in the audio industry together with my colleagues. That is what evolution means, and you will need to deal with it. Only a few days ago, I had the great honor of becoming the first female chair of AES UK. And as the saying goes, with great power comes great responsibility. And I can assure you that the AES UK is fully committed to the cause. We're not paying lip service to the campaign. This is not about standing here and telling you how great gender equality is and then turning our back and doing something different in our actions. Our upcoming student event, Up Your Output, shows our commitment. People always tell me how difficult it is to have female engineers in events. I invite you to look at our speaker lineup and challenge those conceptions. We have a majority of female speakers from all sorts of paths of audio and careers, and we're incredibly proud that they're part of our event, and that this is part of a student and recent graduate event that is hopefully going to provide the role models we need. We have so far received 123 pledges to the campaign, which we're very grateful for. There's 900 AES UK members, so this tells me we need to do much, much more work. So if you haven't signed the He for She pledge, please do sign it and share it with us. We then share it through social media and ask other people to do the same. We're confident that our work on gender equality is making the audio industry better. The He For She campaign says, together we're going to change the world. And as cheesy as that, as that might sound, I believe we are going to change together the world. Because after all, you're here in this talk and we can do this together. Thank you very much for coming to the event. <laughs> the first thing I thought we'd do is actually introduce ourselves and maybe tell us what is your role in the world of audio and why is gender equality important to you? So who wants to start? Ooh, that's the most difficult question. You're, oh, you're there, you've Bartley. You've got a so. lozenger in your mouth. Yeah, it gets the cough out of the way because I'm trying to... Do you want to finish that first? No, 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 I'll go for it straight away. Um, my name's Barclay Mackay. I've been an educator in music tech since 1994. Um, at the College of Music and recently I work part-time at the Leeds Beckett University but I'm not here in that capacity and I've also been a session musician and I've run a recording business in that time as well and I run a studio called Valleywood Studio in, in Leeds and um, I guess you know these sort of things have always been with me because I think you know over my last 15-20 years you know I'm starting to realize about 
you know, that my conceptions about things actually as I blindly go forward, uh, I'm kind of really missing out on a lot of things that are informing what I am and realising just how much conditioning has made me a person that actually is causing damage around me. And it's quite shocking over the last 15 years to realise some of those things and those behaviours within me. And I think that's one of the things that really kind of drives me forward in this. And also when you're teaching students, you become aware of those kind of concepts coming into your classroom right at the beginning when you first talk to them and, and stuff like that. And your, your role is to try and keep the boat upright, I think, really, and, and not it go capsize into these like kind of stereotypical kind of scenarios. So there you go. Um, my name is Liz Dobson. I teach sound for image at Huddersfield University and computer composition. I've worked in higher education for 20 years at four different institutions. <laughs> and um, over that time, I've been very conscious about the demographics of my students being, I can't tell you about the socioeconomic background, but I could tell that they were mostly young white guys um, and I thought eventually I don't want to draw attention to myself or to this issue but eventually I, I kept being asked where all the girls were because I was usually the only female member of staff too so in a music technology environment and I thought I, I don't actually know the answer to that so somehow my career has been somehow hijacked into this um, and I decided to to try and um, activate some change so my, my PhD is actually in uh, an area of social psychology and, and collaboration and developing confidence through collaboration in music technology, so lowering risk and community and learning through collaboration. So um, I applied that by simply um, putting out a message to people and asking what women out there want to come together and share knowledge because we can create a community of practice and this might work. Um, 16 people came together um, in July 2015 and we together formed the Yorkshire Sound Women Network which now has regional groups in Hebden Bridge uh, soon in York. Um, uh, Malta, yes, uh, <laughs> oddly. <laughs> We have an affiliate group in Malta, uh, uh, Huddersfield and Sheffield. And the Sheffield group actually managed to get an £8,000 catalyst grant that we, we fund, you know, we've got the funding together jointly for. And we're making a difference. We're seeing people furthering their career. We, we're recognising that whilst we're providing a portal and a, a place for risk taking and learning, which is what I'm interested in, uh, we're also still a really homogenous group of predominantly white women. So we're trying to address this too because that's the problem as well. So I think that's a pretty comprehensive introduction to me. Hi everyone, good evening. My name's Emmanuel Vass and predominantly, I guess my primary career path is that I'm a concert pianist. So I travel the world playing piano for all sorts of people. I also broadcast, so I broadcast across around 30 countries and my most common channel I broadcast through is Classic FM. In terms of the quality, in terms of non-white classical musicians, I'm quite rare in that sense because a lot of classical musicians are generally white and middle class, so that's quite unusual. I also am a senior lecturer over at Leeds College of Music where I lecture music business and music marketing. But I also run two modules which are really close to my heart. One module is gender roles in music performance and perceptions of race in music performance. So I'm very much interested in equality in general. And I also am a member of the Women's Equality Party UK, who are the only political party who are dedicated to gender equality. I think that's kind of me in one sentence -ish. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Jude Burrison. I'm a senior lecturer here at the University of York in the Department of Electronic Engineering and I lecture in audio music technology. And, and I think for me, my interest in gender equality um, and diversity and inclusion is really a bit about my background and a bit about thinking about the future. So um, I only realised about four or five years ago that I come from a family of engineers. My grandfather was a mill engineer. Um, my father was a maths teacher. And I found out recently, about five years ago, that my mother actually studied communication electronics at the University of Newcastle in the 1960s. And she must have been one of very few female students there, but she never talked about it. I didn't <laughs> ever know this. And, I, and, I, and, and, and she died a number of years ago, and I still don't know why she never talked about it. And I guess maybe she had a hard time there. Um, the, the other thing that happened in my, in my family is that 
when I was thinking about going to university, I was uh, you know, interested in music, I was very interested in maths, couldn't get away with not being interested in maths. <laughs> and um, actually, my older brother ended up going to the University of Newcastle to study electronic engineering, and it was never a thing that was even ever discussed with me, even though we had very similar interests. And looking back on that time, I think, well, why not? You know, what, what was it about me that made, made me sort of be pushed down the arts, humanities, music line? And I see it happening still. And my two children, I have a girl and a boy. And what, what, what strikes me is this sort of gendering of, of subjects in school. And it, and it even happens as early as primary school. And I think, you know, part of what we need to be doing is, is changing that so that it disappoints me. It, it, it makes me feel sad, actually. I love my job so much. Um, I'm really in the middle of technology and, and art and science, and that's a really exciting, if difficult and challenging place to be. I love my job so much that it really saddens me that sort of more or less 50% of the population don't see a pathway into it for one reason or another. Uh, I'm Kat Young. I'm a PhD student from the uh, Department of Electronics over with Jude. Um, and I, my foray into uh, gender equality has been an, a, a series of roller coasters, one could say. Uh, I've always been, uh, I went to an all-girls school, which was a whole ball game of let's not talk about what subjects I could and couldn't do. Um, and then at sixth form, I decided I wanted to go and do music technology. And my uh, sixth form college said, OK, but we're going to have to send you to the mixed school because there aren't enough here that can do it. So that was a, my first introduction kind of to the idea of there are things that you can and can't do depending on what gender you uh, identify as. Um, and uh, my pronoun is they, them. Uh, I am non-binary, which means I am neither male nor female, which is a whole kettle of fish uh, that is undiscussed completely. Um, so we can, we can bring everything together in under gender minorities, um, but we are aiming to broaden the idea as well as including everybody. Um, I kind of, I've spent my life being a very lonely minority. Uh, so it would be nice if there were more people like me. Now, we have a, a challenging question. <laughs> so we've, we've all agreed, I think, that there is an imbalance uh, regarding gender in the audio industry. Now, why, why do we think that is? You can decide who starts. <laughs> I just asked the questions. <laughs> oh. I'm trying to do the oh. same thing. <laughs> I, it's up to you. <laughs> uh, it's the messages that are sent from a very young age. And I was, should have added that, you know, having a daughter. I know it's a cliche to say I'm a father of a daughter. <laughs> but you see these sort of things and the messages that are very much bombarded at her. Um, at school and all those sort of things and uh, we got her playing drums but when she wanted to do an instrument at the school they said you know girls don't play drums <laughs> is there, is, and yeah. this is like literally just two years ago and I thought I thought that had died out like 30 40 yeah. years no, ago girls play flute yeah and they play a clarinet and they but play <laughs> the oh, oh, of a harp. harp yeah they don't play drums or guitar but the trouble obviously. is is these messages <laughs> that they see um, in the media, et cetera, et cetera, all over the place. And I was going to say that it, it's even endemic at, um, when you look at trade publications, for example, um, talking about tech, the adverts, you, uh, like the last conference we did together, I, I brought a magazine with me, and the adverts for since, it's always a man's hand on the knobs. Mm -hmm. It's the first thing. There was one for SAE at the back, and there was a, a, a man and a woman, and the man clearly was at the desk. He was kind of, the, the kind of Photoshop light was on him. <laughs> And the woman next to him was with the notepad in the Serving shade. Coffee? Yeah. yeah. So these messages, and the only female up outside from those two was this article had something about orchestral music, and it was a female playing an oboe. Those sort of things. But even in education, when like um, walking around Lee's Beckett, you see a lot of posters, you know, showing how wonderful, what wonderful time students are having. And if you see a female student doing something, it's a male instructor in the position of power informing them. And these are very subtle things that are just everywhere and these are the sort of things if you choose to start looking at it, you start seeing it everywhere and I think that for me as a male is my responsibility is to start to sniff it out like an old hound dog because they're everywhere and unless you're willing to make that decision to look for it 
and stuff like that, which sounds like an email, that's a conscious decision not wanting <laughs> to look beyond, <laughs> then it's my responsibility as another man to challenge that sort of thing. And I, I did actually have a challenge with a colleague today about those sort of things. They say, oh no, it's all over egged, all that sort of stuff. And I had to say, well, this, 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 this. And at the end of it, he was going, yeah, point taken. You know, touche, <laughs> touche. But that's it. It's, it's not it's competition. It's, it's not, <laughs> not, willing, not willing to embrace the fact that actually y you have privilege and all those sort of things. So, mm -hmm. and I think that's part of it um, for me with those sort of things. And on another note is that the reason why it's been over 15 years is that 15 years ago when my mother died, that's when I realized just how crap my dad was as a parent he had no clue what to do with us kids and all that sort of stuff and we're still navigating him through to this day and that's when he started to realize hang on a minute you know he basically absconded from his responsibilities and all this sort of stuff why did my mum have to deal with all these sort of things and that was when it started and that coincided with the daughter the birth of my death of my daughter the birth of my daughter <laughs> so you know it's been that for me it's been that journey uh, over these 15 years or so and you know, sometimes it takes a big event to make you buck up and notice Interesting. it. Yeah. A couple of things, yeah. one, one springing off the back of that. Um, <laughs> before the <laughs> 1980s, <laughs> before the 1980s, of course, um, we, we know that we have a long history of women in technology and coding and science. And uh, but then, of course, the computer became a domestic toy and marketed to boys. And I think marketing has a huge role to play. And um, I'm a socioculturist, so from a socio sociocultural point of view, um, if, you, if you have a piano nearby and you're utilising that, your, that part of your brain is being exercised, then you're becoming better at it. And so if you're coding and you've got a computer available and that, that's what you're developing, then maybe when you go to do a degree, you, you're more likely to choose maths or physics or science. And because that stuff's available, I was lucky, I had two younger brothers and uh, we had available everything. We had tape to mess around with, a piano, a computer to code. And I think that I attribute a lot of my personal background to that and my interest in sociocultural theory and how context mediates what you actually do. Um, but actually, I think this, this um, context and education are really important. And Anna Colley's work and David Hargreaves and also, of course, Victoria Armstrong's work really looks at what happens in the technology for music classroom and points towards um, girls being disassociated, either disassociating themselves, this is going back to the 80s as well, but disassociating themselves from the technology, whilst the boys were very comfortable to engage with that. And the, the computer gaming culture has a lot to do with this comfort around technology, back then at least, as well. Um, so, in terms of interviews in, in Victoria Armstrong's work, she notes that she's, she's a little bit critical of the, of the staff who say, we just need to put more computers in the space and then, and then this demographic aren't going to dominate and the girls will do it as well. That doesn't solve the problem because it comes back to uh, a, a sociological bias, a cultural bias, which is very deeply ingrained, so much so that um, we did a, a workshop for the Yorkstown Women Network and, and I got feedback from that from one of my students who happened to be in the workshop. And in that feedback, she said that she thought this was important to have these spaces because within our cohort, I'm going to swear now, I hope it doesn't offend, but I'm quoting, um, that we had a group of female students doing a, a computer-based project where they were going to compose something together. They had to do a live performance using whatever technologies, Ableton, touch contact mics, whatever. Um, and she overheard the girls saying, our group's going to be shit because girls are shit at technology. So what does it take for girls to internalise something on such a deeply profound disabling level? Um, well, that's cultural. That's cultural. That's context and culture, I think, that needs unpicking. And I don't think we can um, do something on one night or, or even a year. It's a very long term unpicking in our society that needs attention. Just building on what has already been said about cultural bias. I think the cultural bias and the sociological bias is absolutely huge. I think you mentioned it as primary school and schooling, but I actually think it's even sooner than that in your lifetime. We are engendered and we are pigeonholed into a gender very, very quickly, actually, quicker than we even realise. My best friend recently gave birth to a girl and I wanted to get her a congratulations card, congratulations, you've given birth. And all the girls' cards <laughs> were pink. All the boys' the cards recently. were blue. <laughs> yeah. I had no choice apart from to get a pink or a blue card, even though this was a two-week-old human being 
they are already being gendered, which I found shocking. So I had to get a blank card with a, a cat on it, which was nothing to do with, uh, <laughs> had nothing to do with a birth because. Give birth to a cat. Yes, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Congratulations, you've got kittens. Yeah. It was a nice statement. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, I actually didn't mean to do that. I just uh, get sure. dressed very quickly in the morning. I just. Um, you match the logo with science. Clearly, it's what I meant to do. Uh, it's more that from you know, from a moment we are born, we are given colours. Then, when you look at an Argos catalogue in a toy section, the girls' toys are easy to make ovens. They're dolls. They're wedding-based toys. They are fluffy ponies and animals because girls are supposed to be cutesy and supposed to look after things and supposed to be caring and nurturing. You flip over to the boys' side of a toys catalogue. The boys' catalogue for toys are machines, they are things you fix, they are heroes, they are things that you boys do to conquer the world. So boys' toys are gendered so that boys are heroes and we are active and we are the protagonists and we, we create, we manipulate, we fix, we are, the th we, are, we, are the, we are the chemists, we are the astrologists, we are the heroes and we are the macho men and the girls have the Barbie dolls, they have the, the ovens, they have the dolls. They have uh, I can't think of any of the girls' toys. It's typical nurses girls. Outfits and yeah, things. nurses. Yeah, nurses' so outfits. Sometimes you can get a broom as well. Heroic. Yeah. Sometimes, if you look, you'll get some household chores. A vacuum cleaner. Yeah. Yeah. So the girls get all these engendered products, which are meant for caring, to be subservient, to be the good little housewife who cares about her appearance and making babies. The boys and the nurses' outfits. There's nothing wrong with being a nurse. Clearly, the boys get the doctors. Um, tools, the medical tools. The boys get the tools to fix cars. The boys get the telescopes. The boys get the chemistry sets. So even before we can speak, and from the moment we're born, we are engendered. And if you look at that all the way through a person's life, then all of a sudden it makes sense why there are as many women in the audio industry, because you've been engendered and you don't even understand it yourself. And uh, girls are just, I feel, railroaded into this way of being which has, they've just been taught since they were a baby and boys are not taught and not necessarily culturally engendered or culturally taught to be that way and that's why boys are the heroes and the machos and perhaps the girls are easy bake oven girl which i think perhaps is, which i don't obviously i don't believe in that but if you th if you think about from that's the behavior you've been kind of engendered with from a kid that's obviously going to happen so that would be my opinion <laughs> Sorry, just going out there. Yeah. I feel like as a joke, I should have got everyone easy pick up. And stuff. Yeah, I'd love that. Uh, cake break, I'll cake rock break. It. Yeah, totally. I completely missed what she said. I forgot what the question was. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Where does it start? Okay. Yeah. So, so if we think about oh, um, the yeah. audio industry in terms of audio engineering, obviously um, engineering has a has a has a problem with gender balance as well and there's been lots of research done you know why don't girls you know one of my colleagues has written a, a paper called nobody said girls could do engineering because <laughs> it's just not a thing that's that's even mentioned and mm -hmm. and it follows on from this um stereotypical gendered play toys from a very very early age mm -hmm. even before birth actually mm -hmm. um through into schools and and i think for me personally i think our we expect our children um, and, and school students to specialise far too early in their lives. And if you look at, if you just look at a graph of um, female versus male students taking A-level subjects, you'll see there's just, it, it's just bimodal, you know, there's just, <laughs> it, apart from maths, which I think is about 50-50 A-level students. Biology male is and female. good. Yeah, but, but otherwise, physics, you know, hardly any female A-level students take physics. Uh, and if we think physics is really important for engineering, so you, you're already, you know, it's a very small pool of people, of the, it's maybe not, um, go on. Can I give you, yeah. can I just quote the stats from Georgie Bourne and uh, Bourne and Deval, Divine Paper, Music Technology A-level. Um, what they did was they purchased um, statistics. They, it, they spent four thousand pounds purchasing statistics from UCAS, data from UCAS, uh, <laughs> applications to thirty-eight degree courses over a period of ten years, um, and in that period of time, there was an increase of one thousand four hundred percent in applications to those courses. It was a real boom in music technology. Ninety percent 
were male. And yeah. most of the, the sort of what we call the leaky pipeline happens before A-level. Yeah, so it's, pre so. it's it, and it's way before A-level, actually, because yeah. it's actually earlier and earlier that we get, in the UK at least, our students to choose what GCSEs they're doing. They're choosing them at 12 and 13. And, 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 and because the subjects are gendered, and because also we have this idea that actually you're, you're a mathsy, sciencey person, or you're an artsy, musicy person, then we start to see those two fields being very gendered as well. You know, this is this is a broad stereotype, but I think it's actually true, and I think that is part of the issue. And I think if we allowed our our, our children to study a much broader curriculum for a longer period of time, that might be something that that could help. And I think you know, audio industry, some of it is engineering, yeah, mm -hmm. um, and 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 that suffers from from that as well. So it's 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 a it's about stereotyping of of of, of roles, but mm -hmm. it's also about the gendering of, of our subjects and our discipline. Can I say one thing here? That yeah. One of the issues is that um, for a lot of teachers, their lives completely evolve around their job. Mm -hmm. And a lot of teachers that I know at that high school level, they don't actually see the bigger picture outside no. of mm. how things are changing. That's part of the problem. They're then dictating to the students what to expect for their careers, but they're actually a little bit behind about some of the things going on, um, I know my, my daughter's absolutely terrified that she feels she's never going to get a job if she never gets a GCSE because, but then, you know, there is no job anymore. You have to be really proactive and do lots of different things now. So, you know, it, part of the problem is, is I think that uh, it's so stuck in the ways with the politics of like stats and all those sort of things for political aims between Daily Mail readers and whatever, that it's not really actually looking at the bigger picture, I think. Well, we don't hear those kind of stories and I think you know, like Liz was saying, it's, uh, that's why there's probably, there's a dam there mm -hmm. that needs to be broken down. And at university level, you see that's coming in. Yeah. Just to c connect yep. what, what you're saying, decolonizing the curriculum. <laughs> because if, we, if we're looking at the same composers and, or the same sound engineers in our books, in our textbooks, in our, you know, if, we, if we're reading about social research, which is not social research because it's all about white men in recording studios, but claiming to be social research that's addressing everybody, and it isn't. Um, but those figures that we're putting up there in front of our children and our students need to be very, very diverse in order for them to have that idea that that person looks like me, and I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, what about you, Kat? I think there's also something to be said in the, not so much the, stere the, the stereotyping of the roles is very, um, is in the, the phrase, I cannot unsee comes to mind when you notice that it's there it's everywhere um but i've also come across uh, a, a sort of stereotyping of certain environments within engineering as well it's very very much um the coin sort of boys club gets used quite a lot um and i've been involved in running a few hackathons over the last few years um and it's really really distinctive the difference in attitude um if you look at typically male presenting and female presenting students as to whether they want to engage in something like a hackathon where um, you're in a high pressure environment, you're meeting targets that you've never seen before, you're having to work with other people, you're having to communicate and sort of solve these problems very, very quickly. And I I know female students who've said, I don't want to do that. It's not a thing that I feel comfortable with doing. Um, and one of these hackathons we were running as, um, so I used to be involved with a society um, called Supporting Women in Engineering at York, Sway for short. Um, and one of these hackathons we were running as Sway, we were running it as the Supporting Female Students Society. And we got, I can't quite remember the statistics, but it was very, very majority male students. And we were there at running it as committee being like, how have we, how has this happened? And you get this, the, the, the way that the environment is set up means that people don't want to engage and then the people running those environments don't see that they're not engaging people because they're, they're, it's not the right group that they're trying to target and you need i think to look at the the sort of the gatekeeping a bit that comes with how the environments are set up as well as what the people are expected to, to do mm -hmm. um definitely sort of coming through sort of gr group work and various different projects and things you people engage in different ways um and it's it's a little bit stereotyped to say men engage like this and women engage like this, but it does it becomes evident in a high pressure group environment when suddenly everyone's going, we'll just let the guys do it. It's just easier. Can I can I come back? Yeah. yeah. Um, 
because it, it's quite a controversial thing to, to set up a, a group where it's all women, especially when we're, you know, when I'm talking to somebody who doesn't identify as a woman. Uh, <laughs> so there are lots of controversies around that. And I thought I would have a huge backlash through trying to do it, so, which is why I didn't do it for two years. <coughs> I sat on it for a long time. Um, but what, through doing it, I've learned an awful lot about the kind of knowledges and experiences that are shared. So what we find out is that um, when there's one woman in, a, woman in a space or one person in a space representing a demographic, they feel like they're accountable for their, their gender. So they have to be better yeah. and they can't yeah. make mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, suddenly being in an all women environment means that you can take risks. And of course, we associate risks with learning. If you can take risks and get horrible feedback and make a mess of something and <laughs> not feel accountable or that you're letting anybody else down yeah. or even yourself, that makes a big difference. We advertised, when we advertise workshops for women or girls, Usually, if we advertise an ab a workshop in coding for women like we did, within two hours it was full and there were 20 places. If we advertise a workshop for girls, it's a different story because you're working with parents and communities, very, very different thing. But when it comes to women, advertise for women, women will come. But if you just advertise a, w a workshop in coding, it will be predominantly men because um, I can guarantee that most of the women who are thinking of coming might think I might just be the only woman in that space and I'm exhausted with that and I don't <laughs> want to keep doing it. And, you know, I've been to conferences and I've heard this numerous times where you're the only woman in the space. So that becomes the topic of conversation, not your research um, and not your specialism or the topic of the conference. And that, again, is exhausting. Um, so, yeah. That's what yeah. I was going to say. So there is a value going in those on from spaces. that. Well, there's a token. Yeah. So you are and everything <laughs> that that has to represent in yeah. one very fallible person. And, <laughs> and even, even if nobody else is thinking it, you're carrying it. Yeah. yeah. There's always going to be someone that's thinking it as well. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. But so I guess, no, I was, ju I was just getting from something you mentioned earlier about, you know, pe people always asking you because you happen to be the only woman in the room, where are all the girls? And, and, and I get that too. So, you know, when I, <laughs> when I first took up my full time job in um, electronics department, it was just assumed that I would be the, the person to do Athena Swan and fix our gender <laughs> equality because I was a woman. And it's just sort of thinking, um, yeah, I yeah. don't know. <laughs> I'm not very good. Obviously. I want to come back on that as well, but I don't want to dominate. So, but yeah, so, um, I'll come back yeah, on that later. We'll come back on that. I, I, I thought it was interesting that you brought this this uh, topic of being exhausting because it is, isn't it? I mean, I think many people from the outside think, oh, these people really love campaigning for gender equality and talking about gender equality all the time and pointing out every time someone messes up. I actually find it tiring every time I had to point someone out, like you organized an all male panel again. I find it exhausting. I don't actually like doing it. It's uncomfortable. It makes Many people dislike me hugely, which I'm not that bothered about. Uh, <laughs> you're always going to make some people angry. That's OK. Yeah. Uh, but I think some people don't realize how being the person that says what nobody else wants to say is actually not fun. It's actually incredibly exhausting. But we do yeah. it, I think, because it needs to be done, I guess. Uh, and some have to do it because we come across it a lot and some can choose not to yeah and uh, when people talk about privilege and they <coughs> confuse it with economics um this is priv this is privilege really um being able to think actually i just want to get on with my engineering <laughs> i don't want to have to sarah ahmed talks about in living a feminist life about that constant it's like you're switched on you can't turn it off it's uh it's a calling you just constantly doing it. And, and the word feminism is also part of that problem. Obviously, we know it's, it, uh, it, it comes with so many, it's so loaded, uh, it, yes. it, it makes it problematic. I think the other thing as well, um, maybe thing, and I mentioned this to, to Liz earlier, is about, I think sometimes men, there's, once you're in this majority, I think sometimes there's a pack mentality and no one wants to stand out controversially from that. And I think that's why it's hard for men sometimes to come forward. And sometimes these things, needs, we need to this kind of dialogue to encourage people to come forward. I don't care anymore. I come forward and be whacked on the head because <laughs> I've been whacked on the head for other things. But <laughs> the point is, I think that is part of the problem. And when you, when you speak to people, they, they don't want to acknowledge it because they're, they're frightened of engaging with it because there's going to be a lot of unlearning, a lot of acknowledgement mm. and all those sort of things. 
it's a little bit like you see how the media is reacting now to Corbyn and being a Czech spy, for example. That's a sign of worries in the background. And they're endemic in just how power groups work. They, they, they like to keep the status quo, they can maintain the power, then they can keep their head down under the parapet. And I think that's part of what we're dealing with here. And like the, uh, the Me Too thing recently has been a major <laughs> to undo that. There's a whole thing about um, the concept that it's not just you have these rights. We're going to take those rights away from you and give them to someone else. That's not how it works. We're going <laughs> to also give someone else some more rights. So you still have those. You have those rights. That's OK. Yeah, there is not a finite amount of rights. <laughs> We're not <laughs> out of zero or something. <laughs> yeah, no, we really have, you don't get any. You're too you far in the queue. You can still log into Logic and you can still make your beats. Mm. <laughs> I'm going to take that away from you, but good luck selling it because the market's dead anyway. So. <laughs> Oh, that's how my job comes in, though, so, yeah, careful. So, moving on from that. <laughs> so, another thing that you all have in common, as you said, that you're all educators in, in different roles. And what do you think is your role as educators, someone that is teaching at university level or at college level, to think about gender equality? I mean, I personally, something that I think all the time when I'm teaching, and I, I feel a huge responsibility. So I was wondering how you feel about it, and, and what is it that, as educators, you try to do I, I or not to do? I remember when, when you know, doing your my PGCHE and all that sort of stuff, teacher training. I remember the the Gibbs's four lenses sort of thing that we all discussed. That's really good insights to how you are and how you feel about things. And I remember one of the ones was really important because I did my PGCHE after like 16 years of teaching, and it was quite pleasing to see I'm already doing that. And um, it was about just knowing where your students have come from and what they're bringing to the classroom and being prepared to engage with that. And the fact that you're going to have 20 of them and they've all got these different things. So you, you need to be like kind of hypersensitive to those sort of things because that can set the tone, the dynamic of the group you're teaching over the next 12 weeks or year, whatever, and stuff like that. And I think we all know about if we teach a module and we've got like four module groups, there's always one module group which everyone doesn't want to teach because there's a huddle of very strong personalities who, you, you know what I mean? It's those sort of things that happen. So, and it's, you're dealing with personalities who are young, who don't necessarily think things through all the time. They want to express themselves. They want to be um, seen as the leader of the pack. And you've also got another half of them who are intimidated by that and keep quiet. So it's trying to keep everyone engaged so that learning isn't passive. Um, and just going to music tech sort of thing. I, I, I do remind myself when I'm teaching a class and there's like 20 students in there, of which there's four women, I'm going to think it's going to be pretty tough for those women to come forward and engage with these sort of things because they will feel they're a minority and the boys won't recognise that. Okay, I die so uh, women and boys, sorry. <laughs> I should say men. <laughs> OK, but um, that's one of those kind of situations. And it's not just women and men. It's also you sometimes there's a class thing in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, and there's obviously a race thing in there. And the race thing in the class also means economics, because sometimes why is such and such not turning up? He's always slack, blah, blah, blah. She's always slack. And it could be because they don't have any money. So there's so many things. But those are the sort of things I try and keep at the forefront as they're bringing in, not on top of where they've been educated and the kind of things they've been brought in. And as, as I, I wrote down here, I had one just only two weeks ago. And we were having a discussion earlier about this. A student came to me um, only two weeks ago because I was talking about um, Fletcher Munson's equal loudness contours and how we hear. And he was quite so I've heard that women hear differently to men. That's why they're mothers, because they can hear the babies crying and stuff like that. And I was like, where did you get that from? You know, where's the evidence talk. like that? It, it's marketing talk. And, and so, so you, you, you meet those things. But he's totally innocent saying it. He's coming in and he wants, you know, he wants to have a discussion about it. So, you know, these sort of things emerge and you have to engage and try and stamp those sort of things down and get some like kind of reality checks in there and say, look, there's no evidence. Sometimes there's an agenda behind some of those things because, you know, agenda rather than gender uh, agenda. Yeah. <laughs> so um, oh, I lost my train, train of thought. now. Sorry. Um, it's not your fault. It's just this old brain. Um, so it's it's. Dealing with those kind of aspects, I think, uh, are really, really important, being aware of them. And each year, as I'm becoming more and more aware of the things that where I have privilege and all those sort of stuff, I'm white and well-spoken, I've got a regal nose, I can get away with things. <laughs> okay, But the problem is, is that, you know, I need to recognise that puts me in a better position than a lot of people. And, you know, so, you know, I'm going to be listened to. And also when I'm teaching, I'm in a position of supposed authority. So you, you've got all those kind of 
balances to, to think about, let alone teaching the subject and dealing with the fact that <laughs> women don't really hear different to men. And <laughs> it's only because of societal constructs, a man goes out to work, women stays at home with baby. You know, that's why we're in that kind of situation, you know, so. There is a company that makes headphones and I do not recall the name of this company, but this was sent to me uh, a few months ago that actually makes headphones special for female hearing. Beats? No, I don't think so. <laughs> so I was yeah. going to kind of move on to you, Kat, because I'm just just aware that we always leave you for last. Yeah, yeah. But now you're drinking and now. Ah. And then we can. <laughs> just yeah. musical yeah. chairs as we, we go along. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think uh, part of uh, part of sort of being being educator and being in front of a group of anybody, to be fair, but a sort of group of students is. Um, I, I was at a conference uh, a month or so ago um, looking at another sort of minority within engineering, but in terms of um, LGBTQ engineers uh, or STEM more broadly. Um, and there was a kind of discussion about whether you want to be a role model and whether sort of how you put yourself in a position of being a role model. Uh, and the, the, the speaker was sort of like, everyone is a role model, whether you want to be or not. If you're in front of any group, you're a role model. Um, and you have to use that correctly um whether that means just being visible just existing um or actively acknowledging as you said liz in terms of, of of calling out that you are the only one in the room um and just kind of making a point of stuff um for the other people who are in the room who are kind of going oh yeah that's me that's okay um or or sort of um there was a discussion about things like um so this is sort of on uh, pride more generally, but in terms of little things like putting a pride flag on your office door as a kind of, mm. yes, I'm on board and it's fine. And if you want to come and talk to me, you can come and talk to me type mm. like that kind of um, quiet visibility, I think is really important um, mm. as a letting people who are in the minority know that you're someone they can go and talk to um, should they require it or not, they can be fine. <laughs> uh, but if they needed to, um, I think that's important when you are in front of a group of people like that. Mm. You decide who goes next. I've got four points here. Oh, oh. Um, one. oh no. Liz <laughs> <laughs> goes next. So Unless you so special Give me headphones. one, give me one, give me one. I hope you're not trying to silence me, Barclay. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. They're probably yeah. thinking, well. are hers four. better than mine? <laughs> <laughs> Do we need to just redistribute? <laughs> So I, I, I've given it a lot of thought. I did, I did some interviews in America and North America with communities a bit like the Yorkshire Sound Women Network. They're all very different. One of them was um, Society for Women in Technology. I think I've got that right. Switch at New York University. And they addressed this by um, basically calling a meeting with the first years and saying, right, we've noticed this. You know, if you feel like you're marginalized in this discipline, we want to hear from you and we want to hear what, what we can do together to make this a safer space for you. So they started that society as, result, as a result of that. And she doesn't just have office hours. She, she has an open door policy for students who are facing uh, issues around identity and discrimination in recording studio or engineering environment, which is their course environment. It's, gone, it's done extremely well. So that's inside the university environment. Um, and it, it got me onto thinking about uh, a kind of call to action in respect to university courses. I would love it if somebody or a group of people, i.e. not us, because I think, well, maybe you, but it, the, a group no of students were able to say, this university meets these criteria for inclusion and I feel safe here. This feels like an environment where I belong, not where I don't belong. And for, for, to press universities to say, OK, we're going to meet these criteria for you. And I, that's a risky thing for me to say working in a university, but I say it confidently because <laughs> I know my university um, would address it. Uh, but in this climate of national student survey, student power, student, you know, if students make make a um, a league table, <laughs> the best places to go <laughs> for, for diversity and inclusion and rich environment in terms of identity, um, that will be heard. That will make a difference. So there's that. Can I just respond um, to that? So yeah. there, is, there is, I don't I can't remember what the term is, but there is an equivalent for industry in okay. terms of, um, I, I also come from a LGBTQ background. Intersectionality, who knew? Um, and there is a, um, 
oh, what's it called? I think it's called the Pride Awards. Um, that's a ranking of um, right. so there's sort of best places to work. Yeah. It's very nuanced, though, isn't it? That's the problem for, for a lot of younger people and stuff, that to, where things need to be more obvious. Sometimes those kind of issues are where they're actually being unreasonable to someone else. They, you know, that's sometimes where you've got to call it out. Mm. And sometimes it's not even with respect to the, the students. So I had a situation last year where a student thought it was funny to say a blind joke with regard to Stevie Wonder and all that sort of mm. stuff. And I just said, that's not cool. You know what I mean? And, you know, mm. and he said, oh, it's not about that. But all the other students then spoke up and said, actually, no, it's not cool. But mm. they wouldn't have said something if I hadn't challenged him. But I didn't want to humiliate mm. the person. I said, let's talk about this. It's not the sort of thing yeah. we do at university where we're supposed to be expanding and seeing mm. everything like that, you know. Yeah. So you do encounter these sort of things. So, you know, as a teacher, you know, maybe mm. we need to just be a little bit more conscious of those sort of things and, and speak out. Yeah. But also allyship training or that, allyship training right. of some kind. So students, uh, instead of nervously giggling when something happens, recognising the power they have to step up and say, no, that was completely inappropriate and be confident to do that. Or to at least have a sensible, intelligent discussion about what the problems are rather than it dissolving into something bi binary. Uh, in terms of the educator role, I take it really seriously, probably too seriously actually, and I find myself in quite <laughs> entrenched and quite bitter discussions with some of my male students especially who, because of the way they have just been naturally, grow naturally growing up as males who have unintentional and often accidental male privilege, they find it incredibly difficult actually to sometimes react to some of the things I say to them which and when I do call, I, I do find that exhausting having to call out and call out the bad behavior but you have someone has to and if an educator who stood in front of a group of people can't do that in a university situation then I don't really feel they should be in a job because that is part of being an educator at this level the biggest word I have a problem with is the word slag men love this word and it really pisses me off because there is nothing wrong with being a sexually active female and that and it's just as a very quick example um, but also, I also dislike the word bitch because why should a woman be, a, a woman who is acting in a certain way, a male way, shouldn't have to be coined in this way and it really, really frustrates me and the amount of times I've had these discussions with my intelligent and seemingly well-rounded students, it's not their, as, as other people have said, though, it's not necessarily their fault, they're just not aware of it, so it is a, part, a huge part of my job to make them aware of it and make them aware that they cannot comport themselves in certain ways and they need to just unpick some of the language and some of the lexicon which they have been they've grown up with and it just it just opens a massive minefield to do with sexual politics and in gendered roles and kind of gender stereotypes mm. and I do spend a lot on my well when it comes up I really come down hard in a polite way mm. uh, as as much as I can because it is about just stopping it at the source if I just shrug my shoulders and go ha 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 aren't you funny then it just perpetuates a problem and it becomes a cultural thing which then makes other minorities whether it gender or race or sexuality or class or creed or whatever or religion it becomes acceptable mm. to talk in that way and it's not um, one of the best things I usually do in every September with most of my classes is make my classes watch a quick 10 minute video called a film called The Oppressed Majority, which is a French film. And what it does is the film takes place in which everything has been flipped. I'd really recommend you Google it. it mm. The Oppressed Majority, it's a French film, but with subtitles. The world of men and women has been completely flipped so that men are treated the way that women are treated in society. And it makes a lot of men quite upset, actually, in my classes. So much so that, for instance, it's not a motherfucker, it's a fatherfucker. Like, all the language, sorry to swear, mm. all the language, all the, all the preconceptions, all the connotations, all the entrenched biases have just been completely flipped. Mm -hmm. And it's a video I make most of my classes watch because it just shows you just the shit women have to deal with on a daily basis. My goodness, it's mm. exhausting. Like, you know, just everything from the moment you step out of a, mm. your house, you're, you're commented on and you're looked on and you are just belittled for existing. And it's a, something which men find very difficult to actually understand. And I think it's just about demonstrating that understanding and embedding that within your curriculum and in just who you are as a teacher, mm. I think is the best way around that. So yeah, if you're a press majority, I'd really recommend it. It's really shocking. <laughs> uh, it's horrible, actually. So anyway, yeah. And I, I kind of liked the, the fact that you kind of, you talked about the lexicon because also kind of professionally, um, 
the word cameraman just drives me nuts, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which many of you already may have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Boom man drives me yeah, nuts. Yeah, <laughs> totally. But sometimes you... The sound guy. I know, yeah. sound guy. Oh. I like the term recordist. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I, 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 I make a, a point of making mm. sure, you know, if someone uses that word just too gently, and, and many of people here in this room are actually my students, so they probably notice that. <laughs> gently is... Yeah. Boom, operator. <laughs> but I think it's important for us to let that go because actually, I mean, we're training our students to, in, in the case of this department, we want them to go out in the industry and they will be uh, not just the employees of, of the future, but they're going to be employers. Mm. And I yeah. think our job is also yeah. making sure they're, they're equal opportunities, employers. Kind of so I think that's, re mindfulness. yeah, mindful yeah. of those mm. things. So yeah, um, sorry, Drew. So I think, um, for me personally, I think we have a huge responsibility as educators. Um, and what I see in the engineering world is too often we're um, very tempted to sort of avoid anything that's not sort of making some circuit board or programming something on the computer and, 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 just, and just try and concentrate on the technical because that's why we came here and we, we like to do this stuff and make things work. And, and actually avoiding the, 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 the whole societal impact of what we're doing as engineers. So I think as educators, we have, a, we have a huge responsibility. We're not perfect, but what we should be doing is having the debate and having the discussion and having the dialogue with our students and remembering that, as, as other people have touched on, our students come with all those stereotypical gendered ideas about what it is to be male or female on, in, in society and that they come from different backgrounds and that they come with all these ideas and that actually we're not doing our jobs properly as university educators, I speak for myself and as a university academic, if we're not challenging that. If we just simply shrug our shoulders and say, oh, it's just society, you know, society's like that, yeah. you know. <laughs> and I think, well, surely as a university, aren't we here to help shape society? Aren't we here to help shape what industry is going to be? And what would, what would be a real shame, I think, for us if, if, if we allow students to come study with us for a, a number of years and then they're in industry 10, 15 years later and they're looking around and saying, oh yeah, there's still not many women in engineering, are there? I knew a woman once at university. Yeah, she was all right. Um, no idea, time, you know, they're yeah. just, you know, they've obviously got different brains than men. So, uh, because, you know, because nothing will ever change. It's the headphones they need. Absolutely. So, you know, whilst, whilst, whilst we're, we're there and we're being role models and we're that, that you know, we have that authority, then we, we really do have a, a huge responsibility to, en to engage in the dialogue and the debate and the education around these issues and not just to think, oh, that's that's just society, we can't change it. Well, you know, they'll find out on Twitter, it'll be fine. <laughs> you know, and we need to, and we need to influence our colleagues on this as well. So I'm one of very few female academics in the department, I guess, Mariana, you're the same. And, and I've actually been really, encouraged by having conversations over the last five or six years with male colleagues in the department and just there is support out there i think for some it's like oh yeah i'd never really thought about that but now you mention it mm. and then they start to get interested and then they start and we start to have the dialogue we start to have the conversations in the corridors we start to pull people out when they've written assignments that says you know there's a three engineering man team You're like oh, Really? What? Um, you know, Three-man team of engineers. Like, oh, well, actually, um, and, and these sorts of things. Yeah, and it's a slow burn. It really is a slow burn. Um, I think you mentioned Paul Walton from mm -hmm. University of York Chemistry Department, and University of York's Chemistry Department has been working on gender equality now what 15, 17 years. You know, um, and we're only we're taking baby steps still, <laughs> um, but, it, but it's important. And I think if any, everybody who's an educator at a university understands the role that they have in this, this will, this will help immensely. There is, do you have one last question? And then we're gonna leave the last 10 minutes for you to ask questions. Um, so think about difficult questions. But the last one from, <laughs> from me is actually one that we're also going to ask you as people that have been sat here for the last hour or so, when you go down to the wine reception, not yet, uh, there you will find, <laughs> <laughs> don't leave the room, uh, <laughs> yellow post-it notes and pens that our wonderful ambassadors have. And what you will be asked to do is to write something that you 
tangibly can go out into the world and do for gender equality. And if you can stick them uh, near the window of the reception, that would be great. But now you will have to answer that question. So, I mean, we've been talking a lot about it. I mean, we, we've kind of hinted at things that people can do. Um, but of course, we shouldn't just be talking about it. We should be doing things to be active in changing the world and changing society. So what can we do? What can we all do? <laughs> do you want the wine first? No, <laughs> that will help me. I don't yeah. want to go first because no. um, I have like quite Whoa. a few. Oh. <laughs> we'll get, that's a good oh one. We'll get to Liz in a minute. <laughs> we did a panel before oh, yeah. and I had this ready for that. And uh. I, I, I only got through page one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, we have so to I'm leave gonna go time last. for... Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm going last. OK, what can we do about this? Um, oh, Atty. Oh, sorry. Did you want to go first? I just tutted, not because, oh. I, not because I was like, should I say something? So, no, Atty. Sorry. It's no, sorry. Deaf ears. Pardon? What? Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is that just your answer? Right? <laughs> sorry. Right. Come no. on, time. OK, <laughs> thing, things that we go. can do. I mean, just to get back to um, the thing, it's 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 because, yes, gender is important, but also the thing about race and, and how you present yourself, all those sort of things. The first thing is really is like for, for me is to challenge men who feel they have an opinion about how other people's lives are. That's the first mm. thing. You, you're a yeah. male. You don't know how a woman exists and, and what she has to deal with. You don't know how a gay person has to exist and what they have to deal with. You don't know how a black person has to exist and what they have to deal with. So shut the up <laughs> and actually <laughs> listen and get your ego out of the road and, and just start recognising those things. And also just be constantly, for me, personally aware of the, of the things that I might do that actually upset the balance. And a recent one, um, because in our studio, we have explored the thing about making it a safe space. And we... Um, Opened our studio as a as a, a dry hire for specific groups of people, and we did it for a black woman. She brought some uh, black singers with her, and this is an example of on you know you don't always think about this thing, and it was afterwards um, she said to me, says um, some people might have a problem with your Tintin memorabilia that you've got up there in that corner. Said, oh, of course, yeah. I love Tintin, I love all the stories and it's, you know, all that stuff. But he himself was very ashamed of some of his very, very early publications, but he's in no control of what is now published afterwards. Okay. And there's Tintin in the Congo and it's okay. representation of black people. And, you know, when you choose to ask black people, this, oh, yeah, we know about that. And it just hadn't occurred to me that stuffed on the top of my shelf was a couple of Tintin things and what that impact would have on people if I wanted to make this a safe space. So thanks for telling me. So it's that constant, I, I need to do more. I need to do more. The, the journey's not over. It's never going to be over. And I think really from, from my perspective, that kind of keeps me going. And you know, to be humble when you're wrong and admit when you're wrong, because a lot of people don't want to acknowledge that they're wrong or that they're part of the problem, like the email. Because mm. you know, there's ego involved. And unfortunately, privileged people do seem to have a lot of ego. An entitlement. Sorry. So there you go. That's my mm. thing. Awesome. That leads you your thesis. Um, <laughs> I, th I think. I <laughs> let, let's leave Liz for later. I'm just worried. Oh <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, if I could just draw a parallel from what I'm trying to do in classical music, a, a, a thing that has a, a very irritating statistic that always co comes up in classical music is the lack of racial diversity in classical music. And I've had this conversation countless times with plenty of colleagues and professionals in the broadcasting world. You can't go up to an Afro-Caribbean seven-year-old child and say, you're, Af you're from an Afro background. Have you ever considered playing a violin? Because not many violinists make it to professional level who are Afro-Caribbean. You can't say that to them. That's a ridiculous thing to say. <laughs> but you can say that to an Afro-backgrounded student, uh, seven-year-old who wants to go into basketball. Because I think the, the, the big discrepancy there between saying it to an Afro background child who wants to be a classical violinist versus saying it to an Afro background child who wants to go into basketball, there are role models in basketball mm. and there are plenty of channels and outlets and inlets into basketball. I'm just taking basketball as an example. I don't know why I picked it. But it's just one of the, just there are role models in that sector or in that area of existence. And those role models don't necessarily exist in the classical sector. And they also don't exist necessarily in the audio sector. So I think it's just about championing women and championing how fabulous you all are. And just un understanding that at some st it might take a long time to filter through, but the more and more women feel happy and comfortable to exist 
in this sector, the better, mm. and they just need much more, you know, more positive role models, such as everybody in this room and, ev and everyone in this fantastic panel, because otherwise you're going to end up with that situation which I am faced with on a racial basis in classical music. I haven't seen a mixed race gay boy in classical in industry, and I am kind of it. And I'm hoping that they will continue to exist. A little boy or a little girl will think the same. In the same way, that I hope a little girl or somebody who is a teenage girl, a teenage 14 year old from some the arse of nowhere thinks actually yeah i could do this and i could have a really f f fantastic comfortable career in the audio industries and the music industry and the creative industries as somebody from a non-male background so it's just championing role models i think for me personally okay go let's have it here's the introduction <laughs> physical environment support existing groups check assumptions listening Relieve the burden of proactive social intervention, working collaboratively with clubs, venues, festivals, guys stepping up. But let's go into a bit more detail. Yeah. Yeah, let's do this. <laughs> physical environment. Uh -huh. So Grace, Grace Banks did a nice article in The Quietus about physical environments. And you walk in, you see a picture of Woody Allen. And what yeah. did that say? Ah, yeah, in a studio environment. Mm. So if you go on to female pressure, the famous pressure tumbler, you'll see lots of images of women in studio environments, choose those instead. Create an environment which is inclusive for all people. Um, I found a really great article on feminist hack spaces, which I'm gonna to send to you. You might be interested in also the uh, um, access space in Sheffield have done some really good work on inclusivity um, and what, for example, in a hack space, if you've got somebody managing that hack space and they don't call out, issues as you were saying it's no it's not the safe space they anticipate it's going to be um because the others in that space aren't going so you need a proactive responsible leader in that space so anyway um think about how you want to come to your event so if you're organizing a conference or, or an event um and you want to encourage uh people who are not in academic institutions to come so independent um self-employed people when we look at who's in the institution and who isn't, more often women are, are not in the institution. And then you think about who might be doing childcare. So instead of making this about gender, make sure there's childcare provision, look at providing bursaries for people who don't have an institution that's gonna pay for them to come. Um, so understanding those sorts of barriers and talking to people who face those barriers in order to make it more inclusive, make sure the registration for an event um, supports that person uh, in terms of you know, gender identity, you know, in all sorts of ways. Um, taking responsibility for understanding marginalizing behaviors doesn't necessarily mean pointing out sexism, but it might mean that you're in a space where somebody is constantly being ignored or talked down. So understanding uh, diminishing um, behaviors like this is proactive, that's helpful. On, on organizing, on supporting organizing groups like the Yorkshire Sound Women Network and other groups, um, those groups are often volunteers giving a lot of time already. So when you, if, if you send them a call to say, we want to distribute this information in your network, that's okay, but be mindful that they're already doing a lot of work supporting women. Um, so maybe think about saying, offering your time and expect expertise in web design, administration, managing accounts, advocating that group in your networks, amplifying, talk about them in, in your privileges space, privileged spaces, you see what I'm saying? So when you're at a conference and they're not, or where, where you're able to get into a studio like Abbey Road, um, you know, you can mention that organization and maybe lobby some support. Um, Paying for consultation, you know, if you're not sure how to help a group like that, you could give them a donation and say, use that donation to pay for something specific. And it's helpful if you say pay for something specific, because if you leave it open, that means the group is, it's helpful to the group to be able to have donations and decide what they're going to spend that money on. But if you say, this is going to be useful for this specific thing or this kit, then that might be beneficial. Don't. If, you, if you're a kit manufacturer, don't go to them and say, here's, here's our kit, use that. As Erin Barra said in an interview with her, I don't need a multi-purpose tool to teach kids. I need the tool that is right for that education. Um, and I don't need to be making lots of pictures of our kids and our women using your tool just because that's what you want to donate. So be mindful of what their actual needs are if you want to support that community. Um, and also check if your organizational values are aligned with theirs. Somebody recently came to me um, because he, he manages a nuclear power industry 
um, uh, sort of suggesting they might align with the Yorkshire Sound Women Network as sponsors, and I'm like, I can't, I can't take that on board right now. I don't know what to make of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, checking assumptions and listening. We talked about that. Um, unconscious bias. Um, mm, mm, yeah, centering women. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a book, a book that I recommend. <laughs> book that I recommend is I wish I could pronounce her name, but the book is called Balance the World: Tactics to Help You Launch a Gender Revolution. It's super thorough. It's free. It's PDF. I just bought two copies, hard copies, because uh, they. they point out the problem in sports, in science, in all of these industries. Then they point out all the solutions. Female pressure is in there. And then they say what you can do. Uh, you know, it's just great. Um, can we just make that sort of mandatory reading on every undergrad course now? <laughs> yeah, maybe. This. Um, and relieve the, relieve the burden of proactive social intervention from organisations. So open your studio to a female-run organisation. I've got lots of evidence that proves that these groups are not just echo chambers, that meaningful learning is happening. So employ a woman to work in your space to run a women-only event. It will make a difference and it will help people. And it takes the pressure off those groups to do it. Or for internships, like the Women's Audio Mission do. Um, I recommend you go to their website and check that out. Set equality targets. Serenem, the Centre for Research. Oh, God, can I? not get the acronym of our university research centre wrong right now. Serenam. <laughs> Serenam. No. Okay, <laughs> please edit that out. <laughs> they have set gender equality targets over five years. So there's going to be 50% 50, 50, 50 of performers, commissioned, composers, artists, everything across the board. Um, and if you go to Aaron Cassidy's website and type in gender Aaron Cassidy, you'll find that information on what they're doing. Um, and this comes from the Ashley Furrow's work on Darmstadt and gender, gender research in music composers. So that's, that's important. That, that's happening as well. I might have to, to move on to let... Wear the T-shirt. <laughs> Avoid toxic masculinity. <laughs> <laughs> Black Lives so Matter. What about uh, Jude Cat? Although I, I feel like... This must what's what's life? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So been up a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think uh, I'm wondering about um, <laughs> the Audio Engineering Society as a professional body, as a professional society. And I think for us, we don't need to reinvent the wheel in terms mm. of what we can do for gender equality. So we can learn from our colleagues um, at the Institute of Physics, at the Royal Society of Chemistry, yep. and the Royal Society. So yes, there's committees, diversity and inclusion committee, there are awards, but there's also training around unconscious bias. Um, there's, 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 there's plenty of tried and tested interventions yep. out there. So we don't have to come up with our yeah. new ones, mm -hmm. but we, obviously, we need to apply it to, to yeah, our to absolutely. our discipline and our field yeah. and I, I think you know it'd be for example it would be fantastic to think wouldn't it that every AES conference that's um, on convention that's organized has some sort of diversity and inclusion tick mark so the organizers of that conference have uh, thought <laughs> about <laughs> different people's needs and not just assumed that the the audience yeah, of this conference idea, yeah. is going to be yeah. this type of person. Mm -hmm. um, so easy things like making sure there's uh, uh, accessible toilets and you know, don't have to go to a different building. Um, <laughs> uh, this has happened in real <laughs> life, um, <laughs> you know, and, and these mm -hmm. sorts of things. So there's there's lots of practical steps we can take, and I would, I, I would be thrilled if the AES in the UK was was leading the way yeah. on this. I really yeah. would, Marianne. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> No, to support but, you. Also, but on that point, to, to make sure that in all of my research and interviews, it's always women yeah. who yeah. are in that position. Um, and that makes me really angry because that's an economic, like Terry Winston, the Women's Audio Mission, mm. her career was completely hijacked by running this. Everybody I spoke to, they do it willingly, happily. But why can't she just be a sound engineer progressing in that field? Or why can't you just progress your interests in, in your academic field. Um, and then you're always described as a female right. job title goes here. Mm -hmm. And the, the female label is almost more important mm. in terms of right. where you've ended up in than the I thing that you're yeah. actually doing. Mm. The, the, this is why I think, yes, this is really important, but I think that that, bird, that economic burden, that emotional labour, all of it, 
should be shared. Yeah. It's a res social responsibility Hence not to leave that to campaign. some yeah. people. And uh, just to clarify, uh, for example, our he for she um, committee actually within the ASEK is actually both Charlie Slee and myself. So we work together on it. Um, and uh, he is just as passionate as I am uh, about it. So that that is great. What about you, Kat? We haven't let you say anything. We've taken all the points, all the actions. We've changed <laughs> the world. Oh, come and on, we later, haven't asked fine. you. Um, I think from a, because I, well, I come from a kind of, uh, I was say smaller? That's not quite what I mean. In terms of the amount of impact that you can kind of have, because I come from a kind of student background and such, um, make a nuisance of yourself and be willing to make a nuisance of yourself, like you were saying, Buckley, in terms of calling stuff out and making people realise when they've done stuff. Um, yes, it makes you uncomfortable. Yes, it's a pain. Yes, it can be exhausting, and it's perfectly fine to not make a nuisance of yourself if you are exhausted by it. There are other people who will do it, sort of. You just like look at puppy dogs in your class and whack on the nose. Yeah, just sort no. of flick them. No, bad. No. Just spray bottle. <laughs> um, I don't think you should do that in class. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That's where I'm going wrong. So. <laughs> University <laughs> policies about that. What's that bad feedback because of that? I understand <laughs> now. Oh. Um, yeah, on a kind of on a on an individual level, um, one person can't change the world, but you can change a little bit of the world. Oh, I mean, no, one person can change the world. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe that. Yeah. Oh, it's it's there's cumulatively, yeah. Another thing yeah, to point out is that sometimes it depends on how you manage to build up the relationship with your students in those type of environments. So yeah. For example, at Leeds Beckett, I'm teaching so many modules and you only see them for one group. Mm. But I notice one of my esteemed colleagues is here and I do a lot of teaching mm. on the order of engineers and I tend to get them for a good chunk of time and we tend to develop quite a good relationship over time. And that opens up those avenues mm. as it becomes slightly a little bit more social when you're together. But a lot of the other things, it's very difficult to find an opportunity to bring this dialogue in when you've got to teach about, you know, how to position speakers next to a wall. You know, so that, that sometimes yeah. you don't have time. And certainly for me, being a part-time member of staff, you know, I'm not exactly paid outside to yeah, do all yeah. those sort of things. And I've got of other course, things yeah. to do. And, yeah. you know, there is inequalities in the teaching profession mm. as well between part-time and... Just to, to round up, stuff. because we're, we're running out of time. Uh, and just to so add, and a bit about, to what right? to to Judy was saying, uh, if you're a conference organising, organiser, please stop organizing all male panels please because i'm gonna be there stalking you on twitter and letting you know <laughs> that you're being crap well, you and yeah. I, stop vibrating. a lot of people know <laughs> that i actually do this i don't enjoy doing i don't enjoy going to the website and says okay but then i am i open this website and i see this all male panels and that just makes me so angry <laughs> uh so there's a few uh, people organizing events out there that really dislike me but if you're one of them and you haven't noticed you're doing this don't do it anymore it's annoying you're going to have very bad publicity because we're all going to be there to make <laughs> you look like crap <laughs> and there's also you might not know this but have you come across that um congratulations you have an all-male panel website yes isn't it wonderful oh wow <laughs> have you have you seen it it has what's the name of uh, the actor is it David Hasselhoff? Who is it? What's oh, yes. It's David Hasselhoff. There's a photo of him doing... <laughs> and it says, congratulations, you have an all-male panel. And it's a Tumblr account where everybody uploads photos of all-male panels. And some of them are panels about equality and women. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was Please one, there was one yesterday on There's Twitter. Every day. That was like, it's not us. No, it, no, there was one I saw on Twitter yesterday that was uh, women in maths. Oh, and I the, saw that. With four... 60 year old white guys above the word women and I was like I know I saw kay. that one yeah that was, that was good <laughs> um, a couple of responses to that because the, ne the next part of the response is yes but where are they and and they don't exist and that's where female pressure mm. came in in terms of sound so female pressure created a database well what then became Female pressure created a database so you can search for women yeah. more easily. Yeah. I feel like we need that in terms of academics as well, as sound engineering, an easy to find uh, search engine. Um, um, and I've lost my thread. But that's so okay true. because we're running out of time. Yeah, that's probably a good thing. There, there's, time for, there's time for one quick question because I know wine is downstairs. I hope wine is downstairs. Otherwise, <laughs> this is going to be a huge disappointment, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, this question is for Elise, but uh, if anyone wants to draw on it, it's fine. 
Um, I know that you started Yorkshire um, Sound Women Network, and I myself have worked with uh, women in sound, women uh, women on sound from Who Manchester was. University. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to ask you, which do you think are the benefits and consequences of creating only women groups? And right, if when list. which solutions do you think <laughs> there are to avoid isolating women and including men in the process, and at the same time creating safe environments for women? Oh wow. Whoa. Yeah, you might oh, need wow. to. Wow, good, good, good on you. Ooh, my phone's just failing me. Yeah. yeah, it's all right. I'm totally prepared for this. <laughs> I, I think about this all the time. Um, first, first of all, I'm I've made a list of about 36 different groups that support women, or they're feminist groups that support um, not men, <laughs> for want of a better word, not cis men, um, and they're all completely different, and they all serve a different function. Women don't exist, we don't exist only in that space. So you might come to WizWars, you might come to Yorkshire Sale Women Network, you might go to something else and you come here. And uh, each of those spaces resource knowledge. And so instead of only existing as a minority, you exist amongst others who can share and resource knowledge. And then you go back into those spaces, further empowered to handle situations and with people to talk to afterwards. Um, so I think these are all very complementary and they're not echo chambers, and this is why. Um, where, just to explain, I interviewed five groups in North America, um, Beats by Girls, Women's Audio Mission, Girls Rock Camp Alliance, uh, Society for Women in Technology, and the Seraphim Collective, very diverse set of groups. Um, and one of, the, one of the groups talked about um, behind the behind the shield power sharing, uh, which is something we see a little bit of today, but something which is very, very powerful. And where, uh, Mulvey talks about, I can't remember the first name, sorry, when, when you're an academic and you're writing surnames a lot, you tend, I sometimes forget the first names, but Mulvey talks about muse mentoring. And in conventional sense, we think about the mentor and the mentee, but in, a, in this environment, when somebody comes into this space and they don't think that they have any impact or they don't have knowledge or they, they're not sure they put themselves at the bottom actually they come in and they have a very vocal voice they have a very uh, e equal presence in some of these spaces so a collective might welcome someone into a space and listen very attentively to what their needs and their challenges are they also have a global impact so this idea of they have local impact and global impact because the fem these feminist communities are rattling cages. Uh, so those people who are listening are then rattling cages. So that person's incredibly powerful. The student is incredibly powerful, especially now. So I've, I feel very strongly about that. So sharing capital in a bourgeois sense, social capital, um, uh, cultural capital, knowing how to how an algo rave works when you've never been to an algo rave and being in that space and that community and culture because you're with somebody you feel comfortable with or somebody's brought that culture into your space. It's just a bridge. Um, economic capital. So we might have a workshop where people are sharing their pedals. I'm sharing Ableton and Push. Somebody else is sharing something with Max with me. It, it's, a, it's a hodgepodge of knowledge sharing and access to expensive equipment that some people never have access to, especially expensive studios. So capital talked about toolkit resources, um, building resources, understanding different kinds of feminism. It's a horribly complex world where we don't all do agree, but there's a lot of support for women when we don't agree as well. Um, learning, risk-taking learning happens. I've seen it, it's evidenced. Um, and building confidence by not being a minority. So the Seraphim Collective are able to go to uh, venues in Detroit and say, this is not a safe space. Here's your safer spaces policy. Subscribe to this and we will promote it. Um, one person can't do that because it's not a safe space. A collective has a louder voice. That's my list. Wow. <laughs> I hope I answered all your questions. Incredible. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> I've given it loads of thought and time. <laughs> Oh, and you have two sets of notes, which makes us all look bad. Don't have any notes. You don't Thank have God. any notes. This here is But chaos. you talked about those, those <laughs> ovens, so you, you, yeah, you and you're wearing them. pink, so you, yeah. you match the logo. You're fine. You're doing well. Uh, sadly, we have run out of time, and I'm, I'm aware and some I've people need to go. Uh, are, are you sticking around for the wine reception? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
I know, I know. You really don't care about it. <laughs> so maybe you can catch us uh, then. But please join me in thank thanking our wonderful panel and, of course, thanking you for being here today. Thanks.